I'm Greg Nettle, and I serve as president of Stadia, and Stadia plants churches throughout the United States and around the world that intentionally and strategically care for children. We've learned together that if we combine new church planting with an intentional strategy for caring for the next generation, we see exponential kingdom results. So we're glad you're joining us today. We've been working virtually as Stadia forever. We, uh, Stadia has always been virtual, so this is kind of a natural environment for us. Um, it's been certainly amped up, and uh, you know I'm hearing a lot about Zoom butts these days and people sitting in meetings too long and too frequently. Uh, but what an amazing tool it is, and we kind of love that you're joining us today. As you come in, please let us know when you're from. Uh, we've got a parts unknown there, Bill Brown, thanks for that. Uh, and uh, we'll be getting started here in just a moment. I'm really excited about our guests today. Um, we have Doug Parks and Rick Russo, and uh, two amazing experts uh, kind of gaining facts and interacting with churches and church planters from all around the country and all around the world, and very fortunate to have uh, them with us. We're going to wait about one more minute. We're expecting a lot more people here to be joining us coming into the room, and, uh, and then we're going to have some fun together. Stadia has been involved in the digital world. We uh, learned last fall, we brought together a blue sky session out in Estes Park, uh, Colorado, with tech leaders from across the country, some kind of tech giants from the business world, as well as some church leaders involved in the digital space. And when we came out of that blue sky session, Stadia was absolutely committed to the imperative nature of us planting digital churches and to help existing churches move to digital expressions. And so we have lots of cohorts forming uh, right now on how you can move your churches forward, what happens after this. We'll talk a little bit about that more in this session. Um, we have a futurist group that is highly, deeply committed that are saying we're all in with digital and moving forward. We have lots of our church planners now that are launching digitally, which is really fun to watch. All right, we're going to go ahead and jump in right now about what we're learning in these, you know, challenging and very opportunistic times of COVID-19 and the pandemic that's uh, around us. Rick, let me start off with you. You and I have been friends, man, I, I couldn't even, I, forever. And uh, I, I love you dearly, respect you immensely, and uh, we partner in a lot of ways. Rick, tell us about uh, what you're doing now, where you're involved. Sure. Yeah, I finished up as the lead pastor at LifeBridge uh, last May after 28 years, which seemed like, you know, like a long time. That's hard to believe. Um, and uh, helped uh, launch the Spire Network, which is really trying to connect um, leaders uh, together. It really was a, a reboot of, uh, out of the Independent Christian Church group of, of the convention they had and created a digital platform, kind of really followed that you know, pipeline portfolio platform revolution that's gone on, you know, platforms uh, do a couple things. They, they uh, allow something to happen and wants to happen and they turn consumers into contributors. And so we really saw this opportunity to connect pastors together, churches together, bringing big tech and big data uh, into their, into their world, into that space. So it's been fun. Yeah. And we're at Stadia's big partners with Spire. We, we love Spire and what you're, you're doing. And I know you're involved with Glue, which is another platform. Uh, right. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I went so on the exec team at Glue as well. Um, and uh, kind of connecting a lot of dots. Uh, so a bunch of you on the call, you're, You've been hearing about the, the stuff going on with Glue and Barna and the, really this opportunity to just connect churches together, resources together. So it's Yeah, fun. I love and what love, you're doing. And we love what Stadia is doing. I mean, obviously, you guys have been the forefront of church planting. So, Thanks, Rick. And uh, Doug, Intentional Churches. Tell us about you and Intentional Churches. Yeah, Greg, thanks. Uh, thanks for having us. And of course, uh, we go way back with Stadia. Many of you guys are good friends uh, for a long time, man. So... Uh, my journey, uh, I was a business guy first. I was a Chick-fil-A owner operator for a while. And then I moved to Vegas back in the late 90s and uh, helped with some uh, church plant out here called Apex and a very fast growing church plant called Canyon Ridge uh, Christian Church. And then uh, became the executive pastor at Canyon Ridge for a number of years. Uh, so that's my uh, background. But then we've been doing intentional churches for about 10 or 11 years now. So Really what we've gotten to ground the last uh, uh, several years is this idea of a biblically based church operating system 
and uh, uh, it's a leadership system that aligns a team, a church team, all the way back to the basics and the fundamentals of Great Commission, and then gets us all on the same page to execute well. And uh, like, like you guys, uh, providentially, we were out ahead of the digital uh, innovation curve. So we actually are releasing the market next week, uh, some helpful tools through a uh, digital platform, and uh, hope to be doing that in the coming uh, months as well, a little more uh, intensively. So. It's good. So Thanks for I, having I, I love you, Doug and Bart, and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you know, your big partners with Stadia again. You guys just did it, led our StratOps session for Stadia, which was in a huge process. So if anybody needs StratOps and things like that, talk to intentional churches, talk to Doug. And then now you're helping our church planters with you know how they launch and how they move forward and being healthy churches. So really, uh, you know, again, Stadia deep partners with intentional churches, and really appreciate all you guys are doing. All right, guys, let's jump into this. What are we learning so far? Who wants to jump in first? Oh, man, I will. Uh, so we've taken a little different approach. Um, you know, our whole premise of the installation of what we call Church OS, it's allowed our churches to collaborate because they're aligned across so much language and execution and tools that uh, we've been hosting from the front lines calls. And I think those calls have generated some of the best innovation that's happening right now in church because it's a, it's a very fast moving, the speed at which churches need to be innovating right now. You can't wait weeks uh, to put something in play. You got to put an alpha test in play like within days. And uh, I think that would probably be the biggest, uh, biggest learning we've had so far is that some of our best learnings uh, for this moment in time are actually coming from the front lines of ministry and our thought leaders are still uh, very uh, helpful to us, but it's really those in the trenches guys who are figuring out what works, what doesn't digitally uh, that are, that are uh, what we're bringing. And so if, if you're a church leader, I would say you got to think speed right now more than anything. <laughs> How do I get new things on the books immediately? <laughs> yeah, I think we're kind of moving out of the kind of triage phase, the, okay, what do we do now? And we've got to stop the bleeding. Um, Rick's going to show us some slides about how even some giving in churches, I mean, in, initially, you know, it really dropped pretty dramatically for most churches. Then most churches said, okay, we need to teach people how to give online. And now we've watched this resurgence of giving, you know, and so that was kind of born out of necessity. We had to get that. I mean, if you're not doing that, that's just imperative, you know, right now. But the speed at which we, we work right now, we have to be able to move quickly and it's kind of, we're in this new normal already. That's kind of an old term already. Now it's, you know, kind of what's, what's happening next. Rick, what are you guys uh, seeing? You're collecting all kinds of data and, and innovations from churches across the country. What are you seeing there? Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, first, uh, every time on the, in the history of the world, there's been a climate change. Every, every organism in that climate either adapts or dies. And uh, we are clearly in a climate change, right? So um, and, and just as you guys have said, it's, it's not, hey, are we going to go back to normal? Because uh, th there's going to be a new normal. I mean, think about this. We're going to have just spent somewhere between six and 12 weeks teaching people how not to come to church. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so what are we going to do to adjust to that? You know, we've been asking some questions uh, to church leaders, kind of like uh, Doug, you guys are. You know, one is, what, what is it that you're preserving right now? So, so what is it about who you were when you were gathering that you're still preserving? What are the values you have? Are those showing up? What are the things you care about? Um, and, and then where are you pivoting? Like, how, how are you pivoting in this point? Or like, where's the shift coming? Because you, we all have to make a pivot. And so that means we're going to be pitching some stuff. Like, so what is it that we used to care about that maybe we're not going to care about? And I think those are the questions that are kind of forming right now. You know, what is it that's uh, um, that you're choosing to do that I think you think makes a, a matter? What are you pioneering on? Uh, you know, Doug, your innovators group that you guys have some stuff happening there. Like, how, how are we delivering not just this message, but like, how are we, how are we figuring out what the new measurement's going to be? Carrie Newhouse has been talking about this for a while that I don't think we're going to measure attendance as big a deal anymore. Because actually, if we go with what everyone reported for their online attendance Easter weekend, there were more people attending church Easter weekend than live in America. I so, know. Uh, yeah. And it was wasn't international number, people right? jumping on there. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Rick, <laughs> I, think, I think we've just formed two questions there that I want us to kind of unpack a little bit. One of the questions that you just mentioned is kind of, okay, 
what were we doing that we're not doing now and we don't want to do in the future? And this is a great opportunity to kind of jettison maybe some of those things we used to be doing. But the other question, and we're asking this at Stadia now, and, and everyone, you, you need to be asking this question is, what weren't we doing that we are doing now that we want to continue to propel us forward in the future? So let's talk about some of those things, Doug. Are there things you're seeing that people were doing they're not doing now and really they shouldn't be doing in the future? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think a lot of, you know, it, just even the questions, uh, a little more detail that we're putting behind them, like what do you, what's fine for now that you're going to keep for now but let go of once the new normal's here? And then, uh, you know, what are we going to keep ongoing? And then what are we going to let go of? We have inside of uh, our church, uh, church OS toolbox, we have a, a buffet tool that helps you prioritize your ministry buffet. You know, those affinity ministries. I think a lot of those are going to go by the wayside. I think uh, the morphing of our small groups ministry, I was on a call yesterday with a church leader who said, I don't think Zoom uh, for groups to meet is going away. And guess what? We solved our childcare problem for small groups because we can get on a Zoom call at eight o'clock and connect for 15 or 20 minutes of prayer and Bible study in a way we weren't doing before. Man, Doug, that's, so think, that's uh, a huge, huge learning right now. The small, whole small groups and engagement, you know, and I know that's one of the questions a lot of people have is how do we engage people? And I really do think there are some fantastic platforms out there like Zoom, Facebook, and groups and, and different things where people, you know, where before it was hard to get people together in person. Now you really can do that at any time of the day or any day of the week um, online. Um, yeah. Rick, are you seeing anything like that you would say, hey, this, we were doing this, but now I'm not sure we're going to do this in the future? Yeah, I think one of those is around... Um, um, how we're engaging people from gathering. You know, what we're watching is, is the, um, uh, the churches that are actually creating uh, maybe a little bit of a shorter service, but with engagement at the end of it, like questions, chat rooms, um, people want to respond right away to what they just heard in that message. And I think that's going to shift. I think we're going to figure out how to incorporate that both online and into our live services uh, in some ways. So. That's, that's a fascinating thing. So it's more interactive, which creates a better learning style. It, it gets a little scary, but the reality is, you know, us sitting in chairs, listening to someone is about the worst learning style um, ever. And I'm a huge proponent of preaching. So, you know, don't hear what I'm not saying. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, interactive learning is a much better way for people to incorporate what's being taught into their lives. Let's, let's shift to the other side, Doug. What are you seeing now that people are doing that they're going to want to keep doing? Oh, I, think, I think digital engagement uh, pathway or assimilation or connection is here to stay. Uh, uh, what you just said, we believe to be true. And again, speed. It used to take weeks, if not months, to work somebody through a baby step, a first step class, some sort of connection process. And now we're seeing it literally in days. We have uh, a couple churches down in Florida. They're connecting people into groups within 48 hours of them first attending a digital service. So I, th I think the digital connection piece is here to stay and is really going to uh, speed up the way in which people assimilate into, into your church. The other thing I wanted to highlight, I, I think in the triage, one of the dangers was the church at first turned inward. Like it really became about the 99 uh, from Luke 15. How do we take care of? How do we? But ironically, my take is if your neighborhood's like my neighborhood, I've gotten to know more neighbors in the last six to eight weeks. We're like connecting on walks in the street. We're at helping each other. There's a Facebook group in our neighborhood. The invest invite strategy, I would argue, I think the invest side is at its highest level maybe of our generation where our 99 are investing in their ones like never before. And so I don't want us to lose that as a church, <laughs> whatever the new normal is like investing in our neighbors has to continue at this level. So that's just, yeah, you know, I think we we've discovered at Stadia, you know, one of the things we focused on is the whole relational connection piece. And, you know, so we've been doing this sounds goofy, but um, I've been just having uh, my executive assistant has been setting up these meetings. We call them coffee with Greg. And it's with you know partners across the country and around the world, and it's just a 15-minute window. And I literally get my coffee cup, and I'm getting on with people, 
and it's just relational touch. And I'm going, oh my gosh, I should have been doing this for the last five years. It's been so rich and so meaningful. And so now for the future, we're going to be doing that with people twice a year with people um, where it's just 15 minutes, me touching it, touching me. How can I pray for you? How's this affecting you? What's going on in your life? You know, what a great tool we have and that's been exposed for how we can care for people, invest in people relationally uh, moving forward. So, you know, what else, Rick, what are we keeping now, doing now that we're going to keep for the future? Yeah, so I, I think along this line, you know, the ability we have uh, to connect and disseminate, you know, you know, you, for a long time, business was a pipeline, right? We, we pr produced the product, shoved it down the pipeline, consumers consumed it. So you had, uh, you know, churches were like that. We had a, we got a Bible study hit this time, we got 930 worship, you know, show up and, and consume the product. And 40 years ago, there was a shift to portfolio companies and, and portfolio companies were uh, not producing a product, but delivering other people's products. So Walmart was one of the first ones. Um, um, and the most disruptive business today is platform, right? So in the last crisis we had, uh, there were two companies that were born out of that. Uber and Airbnb came out of the 2008-9 recession. I use uh, both. And, and yeah, so what they do, they, they allowed something to happen that wanted to happen and they turned consumers into contributors. And so I think what we're going to learn is that the church can be a broader platform than just our location or our reach, maybe locally or in a city. How is it we're extending that platform? Now, the key is, what are we going to do with that? How, how do we actually create substantive ways? Um, I think the win out of this is that this may very well be the catalyst to putting the mission of the church back in the hands of the church. Like to do what Doug just said in my neighborhood, I'm, uh, our neighbors are doing happy hours. So, you know, at, at five 30, there's, we get together, everybody brings the beverage and we sit six feet apart and catch up on, um, what's going on. and we've started praying in that group, uh, talking about how faith shows up for us in this. And these are with neighbors that like, probably didn't do that before so <laughs> that's awesome hey um so talk about again there's a lot of things happening statistically that we know across the country rick um what kind of data are you seeing i love uh what you know we have a partnership now with uh barna and glue and spire that where we're collecting right. data and i, I want to jump into that a little bit and see what we're learning yeah let me grab uh and all right, good. can you see that yes sir my screen come up great so on the right hand side so what we've been doing with glue and barna is uh, delivering these congregational check-ins we've done it with about 500 churches it's now available to all of us if we want this it's you could do it weekly uh, i know one church that's done it the last four weeks and their stats this is with about um this was a week ago uh, about twenty thousand. i think we've had almost fifty thousand now um, do it. And this is just the roll up data. And all the data is private, all the we're, we're compliant with GDPR, which is the European secret, you know, uh, Privacy Act and CCPA, the California one. So glue's really ensured that happens. And what I love with Spire and Stadia is that we get to share this with our churches. And uh, in fact, intentional churches is a part of this as well. And so we're all kind of knitted together here. But the, the, the graph on the right was the question of, hey, where are your biggest needs right now? What is it that you're seeing as your biggest need? And, um, and you can see most people said, don't have one right now. Um, but the, the graph on the left was, where are you willing to serve others? And here's what I loved matching this up. So the number of people who needed uh, food and supplies is more than matched by the number of people in the church saying, hey, I'm willing to meet that. Or financial assistance or transportation. Um, there were more people willing to meet the needs of some of those things than, than others. And that comes out of each local church would get a view of their own church. And people can either raise their hand and say, I need help, or raise their hand and say, I want to help. And they get to choose whether or not they share that data. But you deploy this out in a text or an email. It takes about five minutes for people uh, to check in on this. You get to add 10 custom questions to it. It's really hey, kind of a cool let me ask you, let me, let me stop you there. Let me ask you a question about that chart on the left. If, if I checked, okay, I'm willing to serve, you know, um, no, I wouldn't do emotional support. You don't want me for that. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> let's say I'm, I'm willing to pray for someone. Could I check another box as well in that? Or is it, are they mutually exclusive? 
so this one is um, set up to be one at a time, but you can readjust it so it's that you can check multiple boxes. So yeah, so these just are to, all, you know, this was what people said is their highest thing. We're using, you said the customizable uh, 10 questions and stuff. So we're using this in Stadia world for our own staff. Like, so we're looking at all this data we get out of this, but then we're also doing the same thing with our staff internally, the same way a church would. Yeah, I got a couple, I got a couple on here to show you that go down that route. This one here was fascinating to me. This is with just 21,000 people responding, but most of us have been saying in the church, well, we better check in on our older people. They're, they're fragile. They got, but if you look at who is the most stable and the least anxious, the older people feel more stable, more anxious. It's our 20s and 30s uh, that are saying, hey, man, this is not a great time in my life right now. So maybe instead of just checking in with our older folks, maybe we ought to be checking in with the 20s and 30s who are experiencing great disruption. Uh, uh, here's another that's, one that I love. That's the, that's the opposite of what I would have thought, Rick. That's, that's yeah. a great insight. Great. And so this, this comes out of, right. So, so what all data does is allow us to make a good decision. Like if I, if it's this morning, um, if I said, Hey, I woke up this morning, it was 40 degrees. And you said, man, you should get some heat in your house. I said, well, actually that was Celsius. It's 104 Fahrenheit. You might tell me I better get some air conditioning. I said, well, it really isn't the house. It was someone in the house. And you said, well, you better check them. Maybe they've got uh, COVID or the flu. Um, and I say, well, actually, it's a one-year-old. At that point, you're going to say, you better go to the emergency room. And the only thing that changed was you gained more information so you can make a better decision. And that's what I see all this doing. Here's what we do with, this was done with about a thousand leaders um, in churches. And so churches deployed this out like Stadia is to their staff, to their part-time, full-time staff, and their volunteer leaders. And so the question was, what's the biggest primary technical challenge you have right now. And you can see how that shows up. Um, this graph can come in this way by full-time, by part-time, by your volunteers. I'm always interested to see how volunteer leaders see yeah. how, how they're reacting uh, toward the technology challenges. I love this one about what's the most important thing this week for our church to do. Uh, Message of Hope was the biggest one. Prayer and emotional support uh, showed up. But as you look at it, you know, the volunteers really saw uh, the mess up, but, but pastors saw resources for families were their biggest need, kind of more substantively than volunteer leaders. Um, and then here's the last one. How are you going to serve in the church? Um, primary way to serve the local community. Um, what are we going to do to mobilize? And that's the big thing. How do we get engaged? I'm sorry about that. Community by mobilizing our own folks. So really all this does is give you information. See better so you can do better, right? And, and so what I love is I think tools like that, and all that, by the way, is free. Um, that's the cool part. There's no cost to doing any of that. Um, no, no. So, hey, I want to throw up one more slide here that, that we've made because this is a tool, again, we're not making any money on this, but this is a tool we're using extensively at Stadia, and we want to encourage you to use as well. Um, Rachel, if we could throw that slide up now on how people can sign up for that, and then we'll put a link in there. That would be awesome. Uh, so here's the, if you go to that weeklypastorpool.com forward slash Stadia, uh, this is the partnership, and you can take that uh, poll weekly and see, you know, kind of what's going on. And again, We'll put that in the uh, chat room uh, bar so you can see, you know, that that site to where you can go sign up. And and Rick, is that going to be an ongoing thing, like even after this quits? Yeah, the, this will go, you know, ongoing. You know, Spire and Stadia are both doing this as a way to uh, help churches uh, check in. So when we talk about what's going to change, I think to be able to have ways where you're digitally checking in. There's also a community check in one that we're deploying with um, school districts and employers. They can send out to their workforce and say, in fact, I'm on a, a kind of a global city effort um, that we're doing with Mike Movement Day in Palau. And we're gonna be deploying this in about 25 cities where everybody in the city. So I've been working with Health and Human Services and, the, and uh, a lot of the governors uh, about how are people doing and how do we check in? Because the, the, the big need that's going to come, I mean, I think the tsunami that we're going to see out of this is, is the uh, emotional um, kind of mental health stuff that's, that's going to flow 
because of the financial challenges, the isolation that's gone on, the loss of jobs, all those things that have been happening. I think, I think the church is going to have this remarkable opportunity, but to Doug's point, we have got to pivot and think about how we're going to be doing that. So. Okay. So we, you know, we were, I was on a call yesterday with business leaders from across the country, just about 20 of us. And it was fascinating conversation because um, these, these men and women were talking about, Hey, when's this going to end and what's going to be changed? And, you know, the general consensus is um, there, it'll never be the same period. And we mm -hmm. need to own that. And what we did before will never be the same again. So, so don't look for that. And the, what the churches that are going to flourish coming out of the, this are the ones that are going to innovate and, and, you know, be ready to move forward. But guys, you know, this, it, what, one of the things that was kind of shocking to me is, you know, um, the world won't return to normal until really the vaccine for COVID is widely disseminated and testing is widely disseminating, which isn't going to happen for two years. I mean, we literally are a year and a half to two years out until that vaccine is available on a large scale. And so we might think that, okay, some states are opening, you know, starting to loosen restrictions and stuff. I mean, as right now and as early as the next couple of weeks, but the reality is, Doug, what are you finding with churches? Are they thinking right now, okay, we're going to open our doors back up as soon as, you know, the, the governor says we can, and we're going to start meeting again. What are you hearing out there on the front lines? Yeah, Greg. Uh, well, it's the same way we kind of approach the thinking coming into it. The country's in tiers, levels. Uh, and so we kind of put buckets of tier one, two, and three. Like California early on was tier one. Like, Will it ever be over? Vegas was kind of a tier two, and then you got in the Midwest, and it was tier three. I think the opening up is going to be the same way. There are going to be churches in the Midwest who maybe are able to meet in a way that we're probably not going to meet in Vegas. So I think we do have to kind of segment the way we're thinking about the reopen. And uh, But our, our approach and our challenge, my challenge for every church leader would be stop, hope is not a strategy, first off. Mm -hmm. Hoping it will get back to normal is not a strategy. Uh, number two, use constraint thinking right now to innovate wherever you are. So you, even if you're a small church of 100 or 200, a church plant, you can innovate in this time just by asking some pretty simple questions like, what would have to be true for us to digitally connect people if we had to do this for another six months this way? Uh, we think that we need to get on the proactive side now. <laughs> And uh, that's the way we need to be thinking about things. Engagement is a big word right now in the church. And our, our take is don't confuse interaction with engagement. Mm -hmm. Interaction is the hearts and the likes and the thumbs ups. And those are not truly engagement. Engagement in the church is becoming, uh, like uh, Rick said, we believe the church is moving into an era of actually becoming a platform and no longer a pipeline of one-way communication. So the more and more a local church can get two-way communication going, interaction where the church is no longer, we have a need in the community, bring your stuff to the church and the church will distribute as an institution. But how does the church leadership get the needs of the community connected to the people of the church so that it's more of the platform thinking? We, we believe the church that's going to prevail in the new normal will be a platform thinking church and not a pipeline thinking church. Okay, we need to unpack that a little more because that's hard for me to get my head around. Um, talk more, guys, about the platform versus pipeline idea. Just help us understand that at a, at a broader level. Yeah, so on a, on a platform, and Doug, Doug, you, we, we, Doug and I have spent some time actually working on this stuff. So, um, the, you know, the, a platform, again, there's really two markers to it. And, and it, I think I said those earlier. One is it allows something to happen that wants to happen. So look what's happening in, in the life already. People, people want to help. Um, even people who need help want to help. Um, and so, and yet they're, they can't just show up for us, hey, we're gonna be down at the local school or the food bank doing something this week. So how is it we're providing opportunities for, for um, this, this energy that wants to give lift, for people owning their own um, journey forward? And then the second thing, and it really links is, is it takes those consumers, people who are consuming, which we've always talked about in the church, how do we do a better job of this, um, and turn them into contributors. 
And so where, where can someone make a contribution? And I don't mean by that, that it's a financial contribution. It might be that, but their engagement. So, you know, who knew that the 200,000 people wanted to turn their car into a part-time taxi? And there was a need on both sides. So it's not like, Greg, you stood on a corner and said, boy, I sure hope somebody stops and picks me up because I need a ride. Nor some guy driving down the road saying, hey, there's a guy standing there. I think I'm going to see if he needs a ride. You needed to get from point A to point B. And that Uber or Lyft driver was looking for flexibility, part-time income, uh, control over his own schedule, 100 different things they wanted. What, what the platform did was allow both needs to get met and to intersect. And that's what a platform can do in a church. Because, again, we're, we're training people how to own their own spiritual journey. And I've been having to get my own communion on the weekend now, right? Um, so I got to figure out the cracker and the juice deal. And, and, and I get to watch whatever service I want to watch this weekend and participate in it. You're training me how to own part of my own spiritual journey. So the churches that figure out how to bring those resources and surface those up um, and say, hey, here's a path that you could go down. Uh, you know, to Doug's point about engagement, I love your story about churches accelerating that because they have. Yeah, it's it's a it, this is an opportunity, and I know we're grieving as church leaders, but we are in a massive opportunity for advancement of the gospel right now. I'm going to take what Rick said and, and has taught for a number of years. Actually, helped me get my arms around uh, a lot of the platform thinking. Just real simplistically speaking, to church leaders, that it's things like we have a church in upstate New York that. Um, what they did, they bought yard signs for uh, the people, the church, they're 99, and they gave them some guidelines on, hey, put your cell phone number on it. Here's the needs I can provide if you need help with any of these things. And then they uh, had their 99 come by the church, drive through, pick up the yard signs and had them put them in their front yard. That's more platform thinking. It's very simplistic. Any church could do that, no matter the size. And it's connecting the, uh, the people of your church, uh, the needs of your community and neighborhoods to the people of your church. We're seeing it on the fronts of websites. If you have the ability to advance your technology, I can help and I have a need. And the church being the platform to connect those. So there's just a couple practical examples of what I think Rick has been trying to tell us for a couple of years. So, And there's more and more inbound, I'm telling you. Uh, day in and day out, we see churches innovating on this idea of being way more platform. Okay, so I think, first of all, we, um, if you are grieving, <laughs> the, you know, some of the death of church as it has been, um, that's okay. And grieve and allow yourself that process. Um, you know, make sure you're talking this through with others. That's so important right now. Um, the three of us get to interact with lots of leaders and friends and, and kind of, you know, process this because, man, Doug, the stuff you're talking about there and, and Rick, I'm just going, you know, I, I'm going, man, after we get off this uh, webinar, I'd, I'd really like to sit down and talk and unpack this even more and what are the implications and, and so forth. And I think we all need that. And there's no reason not to do that now with Zoom. Just get with a few other people and, you know, and, and talk through some of this stuff. But then we can't stay there unless we want to die, unless we don't want to fulfill the commission that Jesus, you know, really gave, gave to us. And so we have to move forward. And I think what we have to recognize, you know, when we talk about technology, technology, um, currently, you know, the number of people, Rick, what's the percentage of people that have access digitally right now? I know you're up on all that stuff to some type of, you know, connectivity constantly in the world right now. Do you, do you know but, that percentage, Dan? Yeah, you know, we're over, we're over 72%. I do know that, I thought. Who, who have access, yeah. Yeah, so I heard the stat um, uh, from uh, the CEO of VMware that mm -hmm. with inside of the next 10 years, 90% of the people on the planet will have our current 4G connectivity that we have in the United States. And in two years, everyone in the United States will be on 5G. But the whole world almost in less than 10 years will be connected on 4G. And when you think about the opportunities for the gospel with that, I mean, we just can't let that go. It's all the Roman roads coming together. Uh, and, and then how do we take that out and, and take advantage of that? So well, guys, I, love that, I love that technology has always advanced the gospel. When, when, did, when did God decide to send Jesus? It's after Rome had created the infrastructure 
that allowed to go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and and they they had a measurement, they had data, they had they had infrastructure with tool with the roads, and they had data how far you were, uh, how many stadia from uh, Rome, right? Um, and then when was the next big move in Christianity? Was when uh, the printing press was made available and, and the Bible was put back in people's hands and they got to react to that. And so I think we were in a, a phenomenal opportunity. And what we just had, this was coming. This was already happening globally. And it was happening to the church in the U.S. We just put it on steroids in the last month. And, uh, and we're never going to turn back from this. It's, we're not going to go backwards. We're, you know, people were attending church on average 16 times a year, people who go to church. You know, which is, a, it was already a stack guys were grieving, right? We're already like, oh man, you know, people, men and women and leaders were like heartburn going over that. Um, I think that number is going to go down, but I think we're going to see our big things like Christmas or Easter, some experience things, because people still want to connect for those things. But, but we've got to do more than broadcast our service online. We have to create experience connections for people digitally. How are we doing that? I think that's the significant challenge we got coming. Well, I think one of the, the things is, you know, my wife and I, we were online and uh, at church this past weekend. And uh, I said to Julie, I said, um, hey, so we, after it was all over, I said, so, you know, we've done this now several weeks. I said, could, could, you, could, is it, could you do this? Could this be your church experience? And she said, I don't, I don't think so, Greg. She said, I, um, I, I like getting together with, you know, the big group every weekend and the big worship experience. Now I had the opposite deal and I was like, you know what? I think if I had three families where we could rotate homes every weekend, I think I'd be good to go with this. And so I think there's going to be a lot of different responses from this. But one of the things I thought about was, oh my gosh, you know, um, now I need to tell you, you know, I was senior pastor of River Tree for, you know, 25 years and we have the big building and multi-sites and spent a lot of money, millions and millions of dollars on the buildings, right? Um, man, I love the idea of not having to build bigger buildings and throw all that money into that. And instead, you know, investing that money in the community and in the Great Commission and so forth. And then, you know, what if we had a thousand of these home digital churches? But Rick, back to your point. And now, you know, the local church says, hey, everyone, um, we're going to meet in the parking lot of the local hardware store this weekend. And we're going to pack lunches for Haiti. Churches have done that, right? A lot. But mm -hmm. now you have these thousand home churches plus the campus. So now you have 30,000 people coming. I know it sounds crazy to pack lunches, but that's the church becoming a platform, right? Yeah, I would say so for sure. I think it, it, to be clear, we do believe uh, with intentional churches that the pipeline church will come back. There will still be a pipeline church that's here but the church is going to prevail going forward will be more this platform thinking. We, one of our guys said uh, right now, a couple of rules, uh, stop digitally mimicking what you did physically, like just copying what you were doing, <laughs> start digitally modeling. That's that constraint thinking that I was sharing earlier. And then um, beyond that, you have to really start thinking about all the ripple effects of not the church right now has no walls, no hallways, no roads leading to it. It is wide open. And in that is going to come like we're talking about massive innovation. And I'm going to come back to it one more time because I saw someone ask this question. Speed of connection is the key. So <laughs> people are more willing to take a step quicker through a text in or a uh, we saw some success with connection cards, digital connection cards, but it really has been this text in. We have a digital lobby where we're actually on the hunt for people who are not connected and moving them very quickly uh, to it. Okay, let's, let's talk about that a little bit, Rick and Doug. What, when it comes to connection, what are you watching out there? Who's doing that well? How are they doing it? What have we learned in the connection area in really, really practical terms? Yeah, you okay if I screen share uh, what one of our churches is working on here? This is out of the Crossing Church here in Vegas, which did everybody oh, see our, our mayor yesterday? Crossing's a great partner of Stadia. Love, love those yeah. guys. Shane and the guys over there. This is Lee yep. Coates, some of his work. Anybody see the Las Vegas mayor last night? She's a celebrity yeah. now nationwide. You should check it out. It's gone viral. Mm -hmm. uh, 
anyway, this is uh, one of our tools called Engagement Pathway. We're now converting, and this is how our churches are able to collaborate across the church OS platform because they're all using the same language, same tools. So the conversion to a digital engagement pathway, virtual reach zones, what all that is, we used to call it uh, relational reach zones. It's how we're targeting and going after, uh, targeting is probably not the right word, but how we're trying to reach our ones as a church. And so Lee talks a lot about uh, brand awareness right now, the Crossings brand awareness is growing. Uh, they're using social media, but really the track, this, this chart, here, here's a, uh, my deal on metrics and tracking numbers. We track numbers so that we can make strategic decisions and we know if what the strategies we're implementing are working or not or how we could improve them. So right now I'm really starting to challenge why are we trying to get a multiplier, which I've seen all the multipliers out there, conservative 1.6, 1 1.7 to 3, of numbers per uh, device on, so that we would multiply the number of devices on by a multiplier. That is older pipeline thinking, I would argue. That's trying to get to an attendance number that is not the new digital reality. The new digital reality needs to count devices, interactions, steps forward and so we our recommendation is around metrics you're tracking devices that are on for a certain amount of times you're tracking shares because that means people are sharing what you're putting out there to try to connect them to jesus to you and to others and then uh lee uses this framework contact connection and community they're using new school digital stuff like chat rooms and welcome texts and then they're using old school. Listen to this idea that came out of um, a planning session. They're delivering a very famous Las Vegas cookie. You have yours in your community called a crumble cookie to everyone who RSVPs for their basically first step class that they're doing digitally. And they're doing it with Lyft and Uber drivers in their church who have lost income. So they're serving that part of their community. Mm -hmm. But then uh, the viral thing on social media is look at what my church delivered a crumble cookie to me. Uh, they're able to share again. It's filling back into that reach zone. And again, I'm just throwing this up here as an example of how churches are starting to think much quicker, literally for the crossing from church online into the discover lounge is 48 to 72 hours. And that used to be two months, six weeks. Yeah. Uh, that kind of thinking so this is well, fantastic stuff, you know, that, that 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 flow you got right there is so so awesome and and it's part of so so they're taking a pathway that they had that they were doing uh, and they, they've now brought that in to this digital concept and so it's repurposing it's repurposing staff you know there's some staff i think whose jobs ought to shift now um, and and uh, repurposing some ministries we had um, how, how are we refocusing those and, and turning that in and giving attention to this medium that existed? But, but now, I mean, you know, uh, this weekend was a perfect illustration to me. I had my six-year-old granddaughter texting me during church. We were all watching the same service. And my 82-year-old parents uh, reacting uh, to the same service, right? That... Those two groups, you know, they, the six-year-old is going to get there with the technology. The 82-year-old maybe not, right? But now everybody, who doesn't know who Zoom is today? Um, and that wasn't true six weeks ago. Zoom's gone from 10 million users to, you know, 150 million, something like that. A crazy amount of time. Yeah, it, it's, been, it's been incredible. You know, some of the things we've learned and that we're, we're learning as we, you know, that we want to keep. So in the past, um, kind of running the ministry, the daily, the tyranny of the urgent, Doug, you know, um, that was kind of the top priority for most of us and for any organization you're in. And I think what happened in this pandemic is what we realized is relationships got pushed way up and became important. And, and quite frankly, I think what's going to happen when we come out of this is I think we're still, it's some of us are going to go, okay, because the tyranny of the urgent is going to pull us, try to pull us back. But what we've got to do is say relationships have to remain such a priority back to engagement and connectivity. But the other thing that happened that gets pushed way down in normal church world is the value of innovation. And it's shame on us because it took this crisis for us to go, oh, 
we need to innovate. And what happened now is innovation's been raised right up there, you know, maybe just below relationships. And boy, what a great gift from God for, you know, to say, we've got to be innovating now. And to look at that as a good thing, not as a bad thing. And, but how do we keep that in the future, Rick? I mean, how do we keep that innovation fire hot? That's, you know, that's the concern for me right now. Yeah, I think, you know, so, so, you know, we, we are going to um, settle back into something, right? And, and so that's okay. But I would encourage you as a leader to spend part of your day thinking about what's now and what's next. You know, what's now and what's next? What, what, what did we learn? What, 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 what is coming? And probably dedicate part of your budget, part of your, uh, if you took your whole stewardship and, and you tithed it to innovation, um, your staff hours, your volunteer hours, I think we're going to discover that, that there's some great thinkers in our church who are on the front end of some of these. So how are we engaging them in what we're doing right now? And so you don't have to give all your energy to this, but you ought to be giving some energy into what, because what's next is, isn't going to be what we're doing now anyways. You know, um, I think we're going to all sort out uh, where this goes. And so there's a great need. And in that need, how do we meet that opportunity? How do we engage that opportunity? Yeah, you know, I, I saw somebody last week that was uh, doing a simple thing online with their folks saying, hey, um, uh, if you need prayer, just text us, text us in. But if you have a friend who you want us to pray for, text them too. And now they've got a hundred volunteers calling all of those people saying, hey, we want you to know that Doug Parks in your church uh, suggested we give you a call and want to pray for you. Uh, and, and, and it's opened the reach of their church up like in phenomenal ways. And that's just a simple thing. They took one thing they were doing and they added to it, right? Yeah, so I think we have to keep asking those questions. And, and again, you can't, you, know, you can't live in a perpetual state of innovation, I don't think. Um, I, I certainly don't want to. Um, but we have to keep that fire there asking. You know, I think that's, those are great questions. You know, what's next we have to be asking. Um, Doug, you know, we, we just have about you know, another 10 minutes left here. Um, if you want, have questions that we haven't addressed right now, go ahead and put those in the Q&A bar. But Doug, as, as we kind of watch for those questions to come up, you know, anything that you're kind of learning right now that we've learned so far that you go, boy, people really need to be aware of this as we move through this next segment of pandemic life and kind of reopening. Yeah, a couple things come to mind. I've kind of said, uh, said them in a way, but I want to reemphasize. Um, I cannot emphasize enough the power of constraint thinking right now. So for instance, if you've, ta if you've applied for and gotten the uh, P cubed loan, which I can't say PPP because it makes me think about, I'm talking to my toddler, <laughs> toddler. So I'm, I'm adopting P cubed if you want to join me in that. We would say, what we act as if you don't have that money. Like what would you be doing to deliver church? Because you're, you're right, this is a moment in time. We need to emotionally be healthy and grieve, but we also need to see it for what it is. And it is the opportunity of a lifetime to innovate. And some of that innovation is gonna be harvested into the new normal. And so constraint thinking is how you get there. What the danger we saw immediately in the P cubed loan was that we're just holding out hope to get back to normal and keep everything status quo. And I just think we should not be doing that because we're in a new world, like you said. I mean, like the NFL draft's gonna be virtual today. Mm -hmm. Who knows what's gonna happen to Las Vegas? I mean, it really is, it's on the edge. It's, you know, I'm in a city where this, the new reality is sinking in. Um, and then uh, some of the stuff I said earlier, uh, you know, in church world, we all, including myself, we're, we're kind of addicted to the latest, greatest new big idea. And it's led to some silver bullet thinking over the last decade. And we'd encourage you right now, you have to think simple, 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 simple is the key. You have to think speed. So think you're, you're a startup right now as a church. Even if you're a small church in a rural community, you're a startup. Startups, alpha, beta, test, they launch things, they learn. Uh, it's Guy Kawasaki that says, just ship something right now, right? Just ship something and you're gonna learn and hold it loosely because 
next week you may go, that didn't really work. We need to change that. So uh, those are just some of the highlights that come to mind. Keep it simple. Speed is key. Ship something and uh, use constraint thinking. Yeah, I think along that line, Doug, you know, Bill Brown just posted, you know, this is a get out of jail free card uh, for us to try new stuff. It's also the ability to jettison some weight. You know, there were a couple, there were probably some things that you were doing that, that uh, you, you were already wanting to move past and, you know, take advantage of this, uh, take, take advantage of this opportunity to, to shift some gears here, you know, and measurement is going to be, a challenge for us, you know. I, I, I mean, some of the attendances we we see people reporting each week, and you know, like Doug said, three point two device, you know, per device, and no one really knows what that number is. That stuff all gets made up. But when we start posting crazy, if if people came by and they were there a minute, that's probably not a good way for us to to measure. It's like people driving by your church and looking at it, and you counted in your attendance on, on the weekend. You know, you didn't do that, Rick. Yeah, we did, but still. <laughs> <laughs> and we multiplied by the number of people we thought might be in that car. Might be in the so, car. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think there are some tools coming. I know we're working on one with uh, Spire and Glue that's going to actually be able to give you kind of an accurate count of what you had and how many visitors you had and all all of that. So, uh, but but come up with a metric that works for you, and and then use that consistently to see how you're how you're advancing forward. Yeah, and, and I think, Rick, you know, I think we all got to the point, you know, you can, you, can, you can get all caught up in church attendance and how many people are coming, and then eventually you get to the point and you go, man, that doesn't really matter. It matter what matters is how many disciples are being made who are making disciples, mm -hmm. how much life transformation is occurring. And we've struggled with that in the American church for decades now in, in, in that. And please, I think this is one of those opportunities where we don't want to perpetuate the I've got 40,000 people now coming to our church online. I, you know what, I, what, what we really have to focus on yeah. is how many, you know, of those are actually having life transformation take place. How many, how, you know, how many marriages are being saved? How many people are yeah. having fewer abortions? All of that stuff, Rick. People don't grow through consumption. They grow through contribution. And if all we provided is another way for them to consume, then we haven't actually done anything to propel what you just talked about. And so there's an enormous danger here with digital as well. And like all technology, there's an incredibly dark side to it that can be used. But there's also this amazing good size. And, and we as followers of Jesus just have to capture technology for Christ and make sure it's being used for, for good in the world. The same as we are data right now, Rick. And there's an amazing dark side to that. But there's also this incredible bright side to knowing more and more about our people. Guys, I am so grateful for the time you've given us today, Doug and Rick, and just your insights. Please keep up the good work. Um, just love partnering with you. Everyone, um, we have another webinar scheduled uh, next week, and uh, hope you'll be joining us for that. We have uh, Jeff Reed, um, who will be with us. He's kind of the digital LeBron James of the digital world right now in the United States. And we're going to be talking about how to move your f church forward digitally, and again, um, some really practical stuff and what we're learning about engagement and digital platforms. And he's an expert in that area. So he'll actually be able to give you all kinds of practical stuff. So until then, God bless you. Stay healthy. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon.